Let me introduce you to my new Launchpad computer, Cape Canaveral version 3. This computer will take over the previous generation's role of managing my Launchpad. This includes wirelessly communicating with my control software, providing visual feedback as to the state of the pad, and safely igniting the rocket motor. It offers several advantages over its predecessor with its primary benefit in its ability to light Estes igniters, composite motor igniters, and E-matches, whereas version 1 was limited to just E-matches. In this video, I'll walk you through the design and build process that I went through to make this board possible. Starting with the heart of the computer, I chose the ATSAM D21 microcontroller. It has plenty of power and GPIO pins for this project and is used on the retired Arduino M0, which is great since that board is open source so all the related wiring diagrams, bootloader, and other resources will be available to us. To light the igniters we're going to need a MOSFET that can handle a lot of current. I ended up picking a large D-Pack 3 size unit that should be able to handle all the current and voltage that I plan to throw at it. For that pyro circuit I've also included a manual arm and safe switch that'll be the disconnect for the pyro circuit so that I can make sure the board is in a safe condition when I'm close to the board or handling it. For communication I will use the RFM69 HCW which is a 900 megahertz radio module and the same radio that is used on my flight computers. The launch pad has multiple small PCBs on it with red and green LEDs that the computer will turn on and off using the smaller MOSFET. On the computer will be an RGB LED, as well as two red indicator LEDs that will light up to indicate continuity on the pyro channels. To upload code to the board, I will be using a micro USB port. The board will have two DC-DC power regulators on it. The first takes the battery voltage down to 5 volts, and the second takes 5 volts down to 3.3 volts, which will be the power source for the microcontroller. Last are the various terminal blocks. These provide different functions to the board, including different power terminals in and out, pyro channel connections, the terminals to the pad LEDs, as well as protocol terminals to I2C, SPI, UART, which is how we talk to the display, extra pins, and SWD pins so that we can upload the bootloader to the microcontroller. There's also a couple locations to plug in servo motors, just in case I wanted to integrate those into the launch pad at a later date. To connect all the components together, we're going to have to design a printed circuit board and send that design off to a PCB manufacturer. We'll take those files and fabricate our own PCB. Which brings us to today's video sponsor, PCBWay. I've actually used PCBWay for a while now and have had Warhawk, both Cape Canaveral boards, and both Mustang boards made with them. The service is good, the price is competitive, and the quality is great even on some of my more difficult to produce boards like Mustang with its ball grid array microcontroller layout. To design my PCBs, I use a software called Eagle, and the first step is to draw everything out in our schematic. After that, we're gonna draw the physical board, move all the components to where we want them, and start wiring them up. This board isn't overly complicated, so I took that as an opportunity to put as many components as I could on the front, which should make it easier to solder later on. This process usually is the longest and will incorporate a couple redesigns, but after that, it's time to generate the Gerber files and order the boards. To do that, we're going to go to PCB Way and fill out the PCB Instant Quote form. This form is just giving them the information on our project that they'll need to actually make the board. So this is like the color of the board, the silk screen, the trace tolerances. We're going to also order our SMD stencil here since we do have SMD components on the board. Then we're just going to hit save the cart and process the order. Seven days later, the box arrived with some really nice looking PCBs, which meant it was time to solder and conformal coat the boards.
All right, now with that all out of the way, we're ready to upload the bootloader. So to do that, I'm gonna use the Atmel ICE development tool. And then using the Atmel documentation, I am going to use the SWD and SAM port pinouts and connect those to the corresponding terminal block ports on the board. And now we can flash it. To do that, we're gonna open up the Microchip Studio software, go to device programming, make sure our tool's correct, the device is the microcontroller we want, SWD interface, and then read the device signature to make sure everything's working as expected. After that, we're gonna go to memories and make sure that we go to the bootloader file, which is this file right here. And then after that, it's as simple as hitting program and making sure it flashes correctly. At this point, it's effectively an Arduino M0 and can be programmed as such. This can be with the Arduino IDE or something else like VS Code and Platformio, which is what I use to upload the software that I wrote for this board. The software isn't too complicated, but it has some really good safety features in it that I'm really proud of. One of those features is the computer's ability to actually test both pyro channels for continuity. If it doesn't see continuity, it won't even let me put it into the countdown sequence. It'll just sit there and refuse all the commands. So here as I power up the computer, you can see that both pyro channels are safe because both switches are in the safe mode. But as I take pyro channel 1 to armed, it completes the circuit and the computer sees continuity. And then if I take it back off again, it's safe. So that means, again, even if I try to actually launch it from my control software, the computer will refuse it, flash red a few times to let me know that no, there's no continuity, and no, I can't continue with the countdown sequence. If I flip the Pyro 1 switch back to armed, then it'll complete the circuit for this channel, which means that I can start the countdown sequence for Pyro 1. If I so choose, I can even abort it from this spot from my control software by just hitting abort. That'll reset the count and put the pad back into an idle and safe state. But if it passes all the safety checks, it should count down all the way to zero and light our igniter. So really happy with how this board and project turned out, um, especially because the whole reason it started actually is because we had a unfortunate Kato that happened when my brother was close to the launch pad because we had to use this manual igniter for the composite motors we were using because the old computer could not launch the composite motor igniters. So luckily he was fine, um, but still going forward, I wanted to make sure we get as much distance as we can from the pad to make sure everyone was safe every launch. So the next video I wanna do is actually about the launch pad. We are gonna make a new one because this one has been great, but it's starting to show its wear and there are some things that I think I can do better. And don't worry, I have been working on some really cool stuff for Eagle in the background. I am just waiting for it to warm up so that we can resume those launches. So look out for those videos as well in the future. So that about wraps it up for today's video. Thank you so much for watching. This is Project Horizon, and I'll see you next time.